everybody. I'm Kirsty Julia with Belmont Village Senior Living. We're so thankful that you joined us today. You're in for a treat to have Dr. Shavis speaking. He is a wonderful speaker. So I'm so thank you all. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today. I do want to remind you, um, you are welcome to put questions in the Q&A or the chat box. We did receive lots of questions that we will be addressing here shortly. Uh, before I pass this over to Dr. Paul or Dr. Shapis, I do want to read his bio. Give me one second. Okay, let me pull that up. Okay, Dr. Paul Shavis is a psychologist, author, educator, and speaker from Dallas. Dr. Shavis earned his bachelor's degree in psychology at Brown University and his PhD in clinical and health psychology at the University of Florida. He completed his clinical psychology internship at Duke University Medical Center and a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Texas Research Institute of Mental Sciences in the Houston Medical Center. Dr. Chavez opened up his private practice of clinical psychology when he arrived in Dallas in 1982. It was part-time until 2003 and has been full-time since then. Along the way, he has also taught psychology at Texas Women's University for two years and at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas as an associate professor for 19 years. He has twice served as president of the Dallas Psych Psychology Association. His popular blog became a video blog in January 2018 and can be found on YouTube or his website, paulkchavis.com, and I'll happily put that in the chat box for you. His second YouTube channel featuring videos designed specifically for medical professionals in 2021. His practice focuses on adult transitions, including uh, mental readiness for life after work, mental capacity to sign a new will, loving difficult relatives, and psychotherapy for adults. His book, Hard, Loving, Hard, to, Hard to Love Parents, a handbook for adult children of difficult adult parents was published in 2017 and has been widely praised. I've actually read that myself and it was a wonderful book and I definitely learned a lot. So Dr. Chavez, thank you for being here with us today and taking the time out of your day. We appreciate you and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you again. Thank you, Kirsty. Thank you. I guess I should share my screen, right? We're gonna share my screen. Please. And uh, we go here and start the, um, the main, the, go away, go away, go away. The, um, one of the panels, there we go, slideshow from the beginning. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Perfect, looks All great, Paul, thank you. I'm gonna to try to get some of these other control pieces away from it so I can see the screen. Bingo, <laughs> all righty, well, hello everybody. It's so good to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm thrilled that uh, our attendance, it's considerable. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Belmont. Belmont and I go way back, as, as I will say more about later. Uh, Susan Berger, uh, Ann Lynn, Kerasi, Julia, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk with uh, your community. I wanna start um, and with just a little uh, self, um, tell you about me, I, my core, is based on a couple of beliefs that I just want to share with you. I believe that, now we're gonna see if this thing works. Oh no, we'll do it manually. Neither works. We're getting there, okay, good. My work is based on a core belief of mine, which is that life of course is hard, often very hard, and it is hard for a good reason. I believe that the reason people face so many struggles and dilemmas in life and love and loss is so that we will have many, many opportunities to learn from living and thereby grow from learning. In other words, I believe that life is for learning and growing. And I hold that whether a person is in their 20s, 40s, 60s, 80s, I don't care. Whatever adjustment life is asking us to make, we can and should grow into it. So I see my job as a psychologist 
as um, I'm supposed to help people do exactly this, to grow into their challenges, their next stage, using psychological concepts, insights, skills. And that's what I do for a living. And it's very, very gratifying. Now, another caveat I want to throw in right now. Uh, the title of our talk today uh, is Challenging Older Adult, Older Parents, really. Um, and that's really a euphemism for difficult. The word I usually use is difficult. I want to make sure that no one is offended by my using this word difficult. And the reason I think you should not be offended is that I believe that every single person is doing the best they know how to do. They are handling life, facing their challenges, the best they know how to do, and they deserve credit for that. Nevertheless, some of them come off a little difficult. Um, so we'll see whether um, any of you actually resonate to this sort of situation. Meanwhile, please don't take offense. So I wanna tell you how I got here, uh, me and, and CODOP, if you will. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, youngest of four in a, I think a normal range family. I come from a long line of kind parents. Um, but when I was in graduate school for psychology, uh, my father hit a, a rough spot and had several reversals. There were deaths in his immediate family, um, financial reversals, uh, illness, and he got quite depressed in, in, in short. So when my chairman came to us and said each, each person in my psychology class needed to pick a, a, a focus within psychology, and, and he mentioned that one faculty member uh, was looking at geriatric psychology and aging, it, it resonated with me. And that was the beginning of, of how I got here. Um, I then uh, focused getting an internship at Duke, which was a center for uh, geriatric psychology, and then doing my fellowship in geropsychology. So that's how I became a geropsychologist. It was because of my father and the difficulties he was having um, uh, in, in the late 70s, basically. When I got to Dallas in 1972, I was the only fellowship trained geriatric psychologist in town. So I was busy and my practice took me into every corner of the senior care community. I was in nursing homes and retirement centers and assisted living places uh, being asked to evaluate one older person at a time. I noticed that it was common that the elderly individual I was asked to evaluate was described explicitly as a very difficult person. And this clarified for me, I think a very simple truth. And that is that not every older adult is delightful. I mean, who knew, right? In fact, some older people treat their own loved ones with their own children very rudely with cruel sarcasm, irrational and selfish demands, constant criticism, and undeserved anger. So in my work, I began to pay special attention to the struggles that these adult children faced. Every week I heard some variation on, my mom is driving me crazy. Now I also saw that many of these adult children were determined to turn their emotional desperation into a constructive action plan. They were seeking or in many cases had already found ways to turn their challenge in life into building blocks of a better self. They sensed that the silver lining of their troubles with their parent and with their troubles in life in general was unexpected personal growth. And I found myself in the unique position that allowed me to compile these experience, the experiences of these adult children add my own innovations based on the many cases I saw. And it was quite rewarding to gradually refine these techniques and pass them on, teach them to my subsequent clients. Then came 2015. And I realized in 2015 that all of this information, these skills and concepts that uh, these adult ch children had taught me formed a coherent body of thought I coined the acronym CODOP, C-O-D-O-P, for Children of Difficult Older Parents. And I wrote a book. I wrote a book. Um, and again, I want to remind everyone, just like I asked that uh, no one be offended by my use of the word difficult. Look, we know as a psychological fact, at every age group, the vast majority of people are fine. 
they are psychologically healthy, they're constructive, self-sufficient, pleasant, productive, content. But that also means that at every age, there is a certain real percentage who is not so pleasant, constructive, self-sufficient, and content. Okay, so this also means that there are plenty of very fine older parents who have adult children who are a train wreck, a hot mess. Uh, it works, it does work both ways, but that's, that's a different topic. Regarding today's topic, um, I estimate that some five to 10% of people 30 to 60 years of age have at least one difficult parent or, or other older relative. Now, if you are a Belmont resident, I'm sure we have some Belmont residents tuning in today. I bet you know exactly which of your neighbors qualifies as a difficult older parent to their adult children, right? If, if I could have you raise your hands, of course I can't see you, but you get the idea. Well, it's work, it was my work with all these adult children that led me to write my book that came out in 2017. It was written over the course of about 15 months. And frankly, uh, it was written largely between the hours of two and four in the morning because I would just pop awake at 1.30, 2 o'clock and say, this has got to go in the book. I'd get up and write it in and then I could go back to sleep. Um, We'll talk about talk more about the book in a minute, but I want just to show you how far back I go with Belmont. The Bel the launch party for the book was held at Belmont in Dallas. Sorry about the reflection there, but this was in 2017. Uh, Belmont and Dallas very uh, graciously held a launch party for me, so that's how far back I go with Belmont. <clears throat> As you might imagine, there are many varieties of difficult. I'm sorry difficult parent situations. What I did was, you know, for, for decades in my practice with every single patient, I would create a genogram, which is a fancy word for a family tree. I would show you know, who the mom and dad, the kids and the aunts and uncles were. And next to the symbol for each person, I would write down the adjectives that were shared with me about that person's personality. So I was able to uh, evaluate, kind of um, go through dozens and dozens and dozens of genograms and I identified six classic patterns of difficult older parent scenarios. These are, and by the way, so I'm gonna have, I'm gonna show you two lists of six common patterns. The fact that there are two lists reflects a very important distinction between on the one hand, long difficult parents who typically have a personality disorder versus newly difficult older parents who are typically difficult only because of the onset of dementia. So these are the classic six, the long difficult parents. Intrusive parents are those who arrive uninvited, stay too long, phone too often, and pry into the private topics of their adult children. The lazy ones are uncooperative. They are help rejecting complainers. They are obstructionist and entitled. Those who blame and criticize are unappreciative, crassly disrespectful to their children, hateful, insulting, disparaging. They are impossible to please. The dishonest ones frankly lie. They gossip. They betray confidences. The irresponsible ones accept no accountability for their actions. Often they squander their resources. They are easily conned. They, they do publisher sweepstakes. They're, they're getting conned by people from all sorts of foreign countries. They trust strangers over family. And finally, those with the innocent facade cruelly treat everyone else in the world very pleasantly. They choose one adult child to be really cruel to, and, and this creates a misleading public face that is hypocritical. Now, the newly difficult uh, are generally uh, this way because of dementia. So the cognitive six cat, uh, scenarios are, first of all, repetitiveness. Imagine a memory Im impaired relative living with you who asks the same question about every 30 seconds. Okay, it gets old fast. Restlessness refers to the patient who shows uh, frequent anxiety, worry, fear, sundowning. The wandering patient could either be pacing, trespassing, or eloping, all of which are problematic. Having delusions, which are 
uh, ideas that they hold firmly, even though they are false. So for example, they are paranoid that they are being um, uh, unfairly threatened. Uh, uh, my favorite uh, delusion is called Cagra syndrome in which a, a, an impaired person believes that their spouse is an identical appearing imposter, right? So their real spouse is right in front of them, but the impaired person believes that it's an identical appearing imposter. They say, where'd you, where'd you send my wife? You, I want you out of here, send my wife back. What do you do with that? Aggressiveness speaks for itself, anger, irritability, combativeness, depression, withdrawal, lethargy also doesn't need much explanation. So they come in many varieties. And of course, there are other uh, more standard diagnostic uh, possibilities, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, hoarding. Um, uh, there are many possibilities, but these are the six that I found most common in my practice. Well, when I work with my patients, uh, my CODOP patients, uh, I really have a program that has three goals. I want these adult children with a difficult older parent to learn how to protect their own heart, not be so hurt by mom or dad's unpleasant behaviors. I want them to learn how to effectively love this impaired older parent. And third, how to create a healthy legacy for their own children so that they won't become difficult older parents themselves. How do I do this? <clears throat> the core of my approach consists of three sets of 10 strategies. So 30 tools in total. These three sets are 10 concepts to empower the mind, 10 insights to comfort the heart, and 10 skills to guide one's actions. So we have uh, conceptual, emotional, and behavioral tools. So, okay, so this is a top pop quiz. How many? How many tools altogether? 30 tools. I thought this, um, this slide would be more attractive than this slide, but they're all in the book. They're all in the book, but I like this side, slide better. Nevertheless, today, we're gonna go through a few of these. And just to show you um, why it's worth the effort, I wanna tell you that I have found repeatedly that as adult children learn these 10 concepts, 10 insights, and 10 skills, they change their own understanding of their difficult parent. They initially were experiencing their parent as a monster, a wild animal, vicious, dangerous, powerful, scary. This gradually changes, their perception of their parent gradually changes to a wounded, lonely, frightened person who tragically harms him or herself as much as others. Now, when the adult child makes this change, life gets much easier for them, less stressful, less painful. So let's look at a few specific. I think we have time to, to run quickly through about 10 uh, concepts, insights, or skills. One very important concept is that we grow through life in stages. And the stages are bridged by transitions. Now, some transitions, as this picture suggests, are smooth, easy. Others are a little more taxing. Still others can be frankly terrifying. Regardless of how easy or hard they are, all transitions share a common structure with three elements, like a three-legged stool. The three elements are cognitive elements, emotional elements, and behavioral elements. And every transition then gives us an opportunity to practice a strategy for successfully growing into our future. In every transition, we have to learn new concepts, insights, uh, skills, and strategies. The learning is the cognitive component of transitions. We have to recognize our emotions and process our feelings because there will be both positive and negative emotions 
in most transitions, when we uh, graduate high school or college, when we um, find a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, when we lose a boyfriend, girlfriend, when we get married, when we get divorced, when we have kids, everyone is a transition and everyone brings about um, emotions, some positive, some unpleasant. And thirdly, behaviorally, we have to do the work. There's real studying involved. There's losing sleep, there's inconvenience, there's a financial expense to many transitions. So we should not be surprised that, um, that we have this work to do. We are called upon to learn new skills, process emotions and do the work. And by the way, uh, uh, if, if I asked you who here is in transition and only a few of you um, rose, raised your hand, I would say the rest of you are lying because I think we're all constantly in transition, needing to learn new skills, process emotions, and put in the work. Excuse me. <clears throat> Another very important concept is the idea of personality. Personality is the unifying theme in each person's uh, uh, behavioral patterns, emotional patterns, and everyone has their own personality. I am always asked, frequently asked, Dr. Paul, how did my mom become this way? And my answer is the same always. Personality for each person is a blend of influences from three sources. Nature, right? Nature is uh, your, your biology, how you were born, uh, how your brain was structured in the womb. Nurture is the second, and that's everything we experience from the world. Primarily, of course, how we were parented, how we were raised. So that's nature and nurture. But the third is so important, and that is choices. Each person can make their own choice. So we're, we're a blend of these three, nature, nurture, and choices. And it so happens that I believe that the most important of these three is choices. Are we going to go right or left on this, on the path of life? I have seen so often, I bet you have too, that a person with every advantage in life, good genes, a solid, kind family, a pleasant childhood, can mess up their life big time, right, with bad choices. Likewise, a person who had terrible genes, a train wreck of a childhood, can, uh, with work and a little help, decide to be a fine person and become a blessing to themselves and others. It, it's this element of choice that I think provides hope that um, people can change for the better. And it also teaches us to be realistic that they can change themselves, but we cannot change another person. Another important concept is the, the question of values and choosing appropriate guiding principles when working with difficult parents and paired parents. Here's the deal. Normally, when we interact with any other adult, including our parents, we owe them respect for their autonomy. We're going to respect their right, their privilege to make their own decisions because they, they deserve that respect because if they screw up, they will be responsible to handle the mess they make. However, when dealing with an impaired person who either because of cognitive impairment or personality disorder, cannot fix their own messes, then I believe it is not loving to allow them the autonomy to screw up again and again and force other people like you to clean up their messes. So this is a very big shift. I believe that if the person in question is impaired, then their autonomy should not be our guiding principle. Rather, our guiding principle in relating to them should be that we're going to protect their safety and dignity for them. It's a big, big shift. It's a big shift. Now, hand in hand with this, almost the same thing in different language, is the distinction in the relationship between needs and wants. We all want certain things and we have needs, right? Uh, for example, I might need medicine. Well, what if a person's needs and wants are not the same? I, I should be taking this medicine. It's good for my health. I need it to maintain my health, but I don't want to take it. Well, again, if I'm a healthy person, I can handle my own messes I make, then I deserve my autonomy of being respected. 
and I can choose to not take the medicine. But if I'm impaired and I, by not taking medicine, I'm gonna have to go to the emergency room every three weeks and inconvenience other people, then I don't think my auto autonomy should be respected. So values, autonomy versus safety and dignity, needs versus wants, you get the idea. Think of a, an 80 year old parent who's impaired, who was insisting on staying in their own home, their own, their own long time home, despite their significant health problems, cognitive impairment, impaired self-care skills, safety risks. I believe needs trump wants and I, am, I empower uh, their loving adult children to uh, impose a certain amount of um, uh, sanity and uh, choices uh, even above the, uh, even over the older person's wishes. And it's a delicate matter, very complicated. Another important concept, also really somewhat related, authority versus responsibility. So the classic situation is, right, I'm in Dallas. Um, we have um, impaired dad uh, living in Dallas at home. Daughter is taking care of him, um, very attentive, buying groceries, taking him to the doctor, um, keeping him in supplies so forth. But the son in California, the attorney has financial power of attorney. And when daughter says, you know, I need more help with dad, we need to maybe hire some help or send him to Belmont. And son says, no, that's, we, we shouldn't spend his money that way, right? Son's sitting high and dry. He's got all this authority and no responsibility while daughter is groaning under responsibility with no authority. So who do you think is unhappy? right? It's the daughter. Son, the son's, as I said, sitting uh, high and dry. So until the daughter, the one who has more responsibility than authority, speaks up and, and, and says something, nothing's going to change. So she might need to say, you know, brother, you're right. You're, you know the best way to do things. I'm going to let you come to Dallas. You come move to Dallas. You take care of dad. I'm, I can't do it this way anymore. Then he might sit up and um, and uh, take notice and, and make some changes. Let's go over to an insight. This comes up very frequently, um, actually from the Bible, right? The fifth commandment says, honor your parents, honor your mother and father. What does that mean? Does that mean that we have to um, obey every wish of our parent, even though they're 80 and we're 60? Um, we, should we, does it require us to endure any abuse? Well, I think clearly the, clearly the answer is no, is no. Now, I'm no Bible scholar and I'm no man of the cloth, but I'll tell you that in my opinion, what that um, commandment requires or asks of children who are adults is that they ensure that mom and dad have food, clothing, shelter, medical care, you know, the, the essentials for survival. But is FaceTime required, actual time face-to-face? -face? Um, is obeying everything required? I think not. I think not. So I really do believe that it Rebecca? is. Are we okay? I, I think we're, um, it, I really do believe that a, an adult child can simultaneously honor their parent and protect themselves realistically from the toxic aspects of the difficult parent. Okay, let's talk uh, quickly here about some very important skills. Boundaries, assertiveness. I think this is very important. What, what is a boundary? Psychologically, a boundary is a rule, a rule that one person can establish and declare for what sort of interaction other people are gonna have with me. Um, I'm gonna, um, I can decide who gets to have my time at what time of day, who gets to be how close to me physically, who gets to see me uh, in different degrees of dress or undress. These are boundaries. A boundary is a rule. A rule that a person establishes ideally should be declared and enforced assertively. So assertiveness is the sweet spot between passivity and aggressiveness. In assertiveness, we speak up and use words to communicate what our rules are, what our boundaries are, to uh, clarify and inform people what we will do, what we won't do, what we will let others do, and, and what we won't let others do. So assertiveness is 
speaking up with words that are clear and firm, but also respectful and constructive. Let me read you a case illustration from the world of CODAP, of Children of Difficult Older Parents. Brian, a 30-year-old bachelor, was moving back to his hometown to take a new job. On a preliminary visit, he rented an apartment and arranged for his furniture and accessories to be moved to the city and into his new home. He planned to arrive in town with a full week free for unpacking and setting up his place. His mother, who had always been, always overbearing, desperately wanted to help Brian. She begged her son repeatedly for a key to his apartment because she wanted to arrange his furniture and hang his pictures herself. She declared dramatically how much she would enjoy doing this for him, implying that he owed her this pleasure. Brian, who had had considerable counseling regarding his difficult mother, knew that he must enforce his personal boundaries with her or risk an avalanche of invasions by her into his life as he moved back into the city where she lived. So every time that his mom begged for or demanded the keys, Brian responded calmly and pleasantly, thank you so much, mom. That's very kind of you, but I will be doing it myself. I have some ideas that I want to experiment with and I will need to be there myself to make these decisions. When his mom repeated her pleas, Brian simply repeated this answer. And finally, mom relented. In this way, Brian not only resolved this challenge, he delivered a message to his mom that he was now his own man. He had behaved assertively, right? Neither passively nor aggressively. And he had established a firm and healthy boundary. We should all be like Brian. Another very important skill, and frankly, one of the, in my opinion, the, well, we're getting to the really the heart of the book. Skill number five is become a smarter fish. So in this picture, which I love, uh, the original is right here. Mm, can you see it? Yeah, like that. There you go. The person in the boat is the difficult person. And you, the adult child, are the fish. So the difficult person drops in front of you this juicy, provocative, terrible, maybe untrue, unkind statement or action that just screams for a response, right? You wanna engage with them and argue with them and convince them that they're being, uh, um, they're lying or uh, being mean and you wanna correct this terrible injustice. Well, th what that amounts to is taking the bait. And what's inside the bait? A hook. So if you engage, you're hooked. Not a good situation because you're gonna end up on the fisherman's dinner platter that night. So the skill to be learned in becoming a smarter fish is basically to not take the bait, to not be surprised that this chronically difficult person has once again behaved in a difficult way. It's learning to stop being willing to again enact your part in the same old tired play, all right? That's becoming a smarter fish. How, does it, how is this done? How do we avoid taking the bait and um, avoid falling into another pointless confrontation. Here's the deal. People who are impaired, either in their personality or their thinking ability, disregard the rules of logic. 
they just don't think logically. They don't really care what's um, if we're if if if, if their um, conclusions are justified logically. So confronting them and arguing about it based on the logic of things is pointless. And especially if they're memory impaired, let's say after a half hour argument and everyone's feelings are hurt, um, you finally get them to agree. Well, in an hour or two or a day, it's all forgotten and repeated anyway. So it really was quite pointless. How do we avoid this pointless confrontation? We have reached the point where I'm gonna share with you what I call Dr. Paul's famous two-part recipe for avoiding pointless confrontation with an irrational person. Okay, you ready to write down the recipe? The first ingredient in the recipe is that you are going to be vague about facts. Okay, so they, um, he says, um, um, you stole money from me. Instead of saying, yes, I did, or no, I didn't, you're going to say, oh, my goodness. It's pretty vague, right? You're not going to say yes or no. We'll talk more about how to do this. The second ingredient in this recipe is that you are going to express empathy for the person's feelings, their emotions. All right? So, um, and I've got an example of this in a minute. Uh, but this, I want you to really, really take this to heart because I consider this uh, the most useful single piece of the book. Of, about, of, out, of, out, of, out of all 30 tools, this is my favorite, avoiding pointless confrontation with this two-part recipe. Vague about facts and empathic about feelings. And by the way, there is a three-word phrase which is vague and empathic. And that three word phrase, which I recommend to you highly is, I hear you. I will share with you that I make a living telling my patients, I hear you. We all like to be um, validated, acknowledged. They, they're they not, um, the, if, when someone says, I hear you to, to me, I know they're not gonna argue with me and they acknowledge my right to have my emotions. So it's a very powerful and useful phrase. A related strategy to this two-part recipe, but still designed to avoid pointless confrontation is the therapeutic fib. So if we are talking to a person who does not um, uh, feel a loyalty to the rules of logic, then for their benefit, it is completely acceptable to bend the truth a little bit to uh, not necessarily share every detail of the truth. We do this and we tell them a little therapeutic fib, a little white lie. We do this for their benefit. We do this to help them do um, and participate in actions that are actually good for them. Whether it's taking medicine, whether it's getting in the car to go someplace we have to go. We don't, ne we don't necessarily have to share the entire truth as we would with a healthy person who deserved our respect for their autonomy. So the therapeutic fib, things like um, um, the, the car has been taken away. Well, how long are you gonna keep my car from me? We know it's likely forever, but we don't have to tell them forever. We can say, well, for now, just for now, uh, until the doctor says such and such, but this phrase for now is a useful therapeutic fib. So these are skills that help you avoid a train wreck, a catastrophe. Let me read you another example. Clint often visited his elderly dad who had moderate Alzheimer's disease <clears throat> and who lives in a secured memory care unit. As Clint explained to me, during every visit, dad angrily insisted that at the end of this visit, he is leaving with Clint, returning to his home, getting into his car, and driving to Kansas City to visit his parents. Clint repeatedly explained that um, his dad's home has been sold. His car has been sold. His dad is now living here because he has memory problems, and he needs help, and he was not safe at home. And by the way, dad, your parents are long dead and Kansas City is 1,500 miles away, et cetera, et cetera. 
well, how do you think that went, right? It never went very well because dad disputed every fact that Clint cited. Sometimes it went very bad indeed. Well, as Clint learned his code op skills, he learned to avoid these pointless confrontations with his memory impaired father. So now when dad says, now don't you try to leave here without me today, I'm going home to get my car and you can't stop me, you hear? Clint responds, yes, sir, I hear you. Dad says, well, how is my car? Is it gassed up and ready to go? Clint says, that's a good question. I haven't seen it in a while. What do you mean you haven't seen it? It's right there in my driveway, isn't it? Could be. I've been so lately, I've been so busy lately, I have, I'm afraid I haven't looked. Clint says, I'm really sorry about that, Dad, because I know how important that Buick is to you. It's a great car, a real pleasure to drive. And by the way, Dad, tell me about the guy you bought the car from. Wasn't he an old friend of yours? Kind of redirects him. So you see, we, we're, we've avoided the, um, the pointless confrontation. I'm going to skip, skip ahead because I want to save time. I think there are a lot of questions and answers. Um, I want to go to skill number 10. So we've had concepts, insights, skills. This is skill number 10, kind of the climax of the book. I, I call it code op stop. How can we as um, middle-aged adults be sure that our adult children never consider us difficult? How do, cre how do we create a healthy legacy for our own children and break any intergenerational cascade of toxic parenting that has come before us in our family. And it's really easy. I simply urge code ops to work at being the best person they can be. They want, I want them to be the kind of person, the kind of parent that they always wanted their own parent to be. How is this done? I believe it's done by showing more of certain traits and less of others less hypocrisy, criticism, sarcasm, belittling, lecturing, pushiness, and more authenticity, patience, kindness, encouragement, listening, respect, less demanding, less pride, less callousness, insensitivity to others, less scowling, less impulsivity, less selfishness, and more gratitude, humility, empathy, more smiling, more self-control, self-discipline, and more giving and generosity. Or to really sum it up, and maybe as a parallel, but also an enhancement, I can sum it up as saying less passivity, less aggressiveness, and more assertiveness, where we simply are authentic, clear, firm, but also respectful, kind, and constructive. And finally, as part of Code Op Stop, really the cherry on top, I urge adults to solicit feedback from their loved ones. Ask their loved ones, their family members, how am I doing? What's it like to be married to me? What's it like to have me as a parent? I mean, is this, uh, this takes courage, doesn't it? I've, I've, I've mentioned this in front of groups of people in live speeches, remember live speeches before, before COVID. Um, and I'd, I'd hear someone go, oh no, not gonna happen. <laughs> but let me read you a case illustration. Sean and Doris, married in their late 20s and are now in their later 40s. Their three children are teenagers. Doris's mother and Sean's father have both always been difficult individuals. So both Sean and Doris carry emotional scars from their childhoods. Sean's father passed away just two years ago, but Doris's mother is still living and still difficult. Doris had several consultation sessions with me to master these code op uh, tools. And the crowning accomplishment that Doris wanted to work on was to protect against giving her children and husband the same sort of toxic experience that her mom had given her husband and children. 
Her specific steps toward this goal began with reviewing and understanding the guidance in this more and less table shown here. Her next step was to invite her husband and later her kids too, to give her feedback on her behavior and personality. Let me say that again. Can you imagine doing this? Ask your loved ones to give you feedback on, on your behavior and personality Woo. as they had experienced it in their interactions with her. She asked them to schedule a time to sit down with her for an hour in a quiet place and without interruptions. She began each meeting by thanking them for agreeing to meet with her. She then asked them for honest feedback using the questions mentioned above. She listened calmly and respectfully. She even took notes. She thought of their feedback as a precious gift of knowledge from the mouths of people who were experts on her. She frequently asked them to pause so she could paraphrase their comments back to them to make sure she understood them correctly. She would say, I think what I hear you saying is, and then uh, paraphrase it, and then follow that with, did I get that right? Or is there something you'd like to clarify for me? She did not speak one word of self-defense or self-justification, and of course, no criticism of the speaker. At the meeting's end, she again thanked them and told them she loved them and would do all she could to use the feedback constructively. The meetings caused her husband and kids to all feel much closer to Doris and more loved by her than ever before. Inspired by his wife's commitment to not replicate her mother's mistakes, Sean later asked Doris and their children to sit down with him too for the same sort of feedback meeting. So this to me is, is really the pinnacle. Um, uh, and I, I just wanna be very explicit about the punchline that I want you to take away from, from my talk today, which I'm so appreciative of your time for. It is virtually impossible to change another person. We cannot change our difficult relatives. Instead, our plan, I believe, should be to learn and master the sorts of concepts, insights, and skills that I've talked about so that we can successfully manage this stage, this chapter in our own lives. It's not really about the difficult relative. It's about us growing into the challenge by learning new skills, a new outlook, right? So that's really what the book is all about. I'll show you the book, this is the book. If you are in this position, if you have a friend whose difficult relative makes them feel like a failure, makes them feel terrible, be a friend, get them the book, get it for yourself. That's the book. So this is my world, or actually it was until you know March of uh, 2020 um, when I moved my office uh, to a room in my house. Uh, and you know, virtually uh, therapy worked really well. Uh, now I'm back. I'm back uh, doing some virtual from the office, but actually seeing a lot of patients who are vaccinated uh, here in the office. Um, either way, whether, you know, whichever office I'm in, the meaning in my life comes from helping my patients see themselves, their situation, their future, and the entire world with new eyes and with a newly courageous attitude. I have the best job in the world every day. I have the pleasure of watching real people gradually transform real pain into real strengths and skills that will last them a lifetime. It's just a, a wonderful thing to watch. I see my patients and myself as a therapeutic team and together we move the patient into their future better equipped to succeed in life. So I really hope that uh, in today's talk, you found some little psychological nugget um, that uh, you know, comes from my experience, but that you can take forward. And that uh, if you are running into any kind of challenge in life, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Wherever you are, whatever city you're in, and I know, I know you're all spread out, find your therapist, find your consultant, your coach. And look, in many cases, it's gonna be uh, someone on the staff of a facility like Belmont Village. 
So that's my that's my soapbox. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I want to open the floor up for questions. Thank you, Paul. We had lots of great questions that just came through. So I do want to get to a few of those. I know of, I don't know about the rest of you, but my hand is hurting from taking all those notes. That was wonderful. Lots of lots of great information. And um, one question that came through that I'm looking at right now is my mother-in-law passed under hospice care um, in a community one month ago. Uh, my father-in-law has been doing pretty well, but now we're noticing that he's getting cranky specifically about his meals, complaining daily. What is a good way to manage this? Uh, did the questioner say what his cognitive level is? He did not. He did not. And that, that, that would help. I, I agree with you. Well, so generically, I would suggest um, asking him what's on his mind. What's life like now? How's he feeling emotionally? What are his thoughts about where he is in life? Okay, and then let him talk. In other words, ask the question and then close your lips and you're gonna listen. Uh, now, now look at my eyes. I'm, I'm, my eyes are open and I'm looking at him, right? As opposed to, right? I'm listening, sending the message that what he is saying is important and worth listening to. And here's the trick. No matter what he says, you say, I hear you. That makes sense to me. We're not going to give him a rah-rah speech, try to talk him out of his bad feelings. We're going to acknowledge his bad feelings, honor them, and actually that will help him get past them sooner than trying to cheer him up. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question I have here is how to react to a parent that continues to tell me about feeling lonely and not feeling supported, and on the other hand, refuses any offers of help whatsoever. I live ah. several hundred miles away and am not able to be there in person, but I would love to help more. Beautiful. So we have a classic help rejecting complainer. Yes. Um, and it, I, th I think there's a need to um, decide which um, complaints truly need attention and truly can be Im improved upon or fixed in which uh, we just have to learn to tolerate, okay? But the listening is a, a true gift. It's a very loving gift that the, the adult child, I presume, is giving mom. Um, and I want the adult child to take pride in uh, the, the love that that listening time communicates, right? So um, it, it's like um, just letting the steam off uh, of a boiling pot. Uh, it, it's already um, an intervention just to listen and say, I really appreciate you sharing with me and I hope things get better, but we're going to talk next week, no matter what, or, or tomorrow, no matter what, whatever it is. Great. Thank you. Um, another one is a two questions. My mom lives in an assisted living home. She has dementia. It is in total denial. How, how do you talk to her about this? Will she ever believe she has dementia? I don't think it's necessary that she acknowledge the dementia at all. Um, I mean, I haven't heard in the question there's a need for it. Um, if there's some change that needs to be made because of her dementia, then if um, you know the family and the staff agree the change needs to be made, then the change is simply made, for example, moving to a memory care unit, and we, um, uh, we are vague and empathic about her feelings, about her, whatever her response is. But if her needs mean that she needs to be in a memory care unit to be safe, then we're going to move her, you know, finesse her there and, and be empathic, empathic, empathic. That's and let, let the program do its magic because she's going to be busy with appropriate activities and kind staff and good food and a comfortable bed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other part of it is um, my other sibling has been taking advantage of my mom financially which has been, or which has been sol solved, but also influencing her negativity towards me and other family members. Any suggestions on how to regain trust? It's a hard one. These are real life uh, high octane uh, challenges, no question about it. 
uh, it might take a while and the, the regain trust might never happen. But I think that um, honoring your parent by making sure their needs are met, um, avoiding pointless confrontations that, that produce nothing beneficial um, is the high road. Um, I mean, this is, um, I, I would, I think it's a, again, a very loving and generous thing that the adult child is doing, taking care of this, uh, not only impaired, but difficult older parent, uh, making sure their needs are met. That's all anybody can ask of you. I've, I've lost your audio. Sorry, I, I apologize. Sorry, there's a bunch of them coming in at one time. I apologize. Yeah. One second. I uh, lots of good compliments on tips on um, communicating. So thank you, Paul. Um, another one just came in. Uh, both my parents recently moved to Belmont Village. My father's 98 with advanced dementia and my mother, 86 years old, opt to stay with him on the memory care floor. They have been married 70 years and everyone, including the memory care professionals, thought for now it's best... Um, oh gosh, it was, it's getting cut off. I apologize, Paul, give me one second. Um, if you like, I'll just dive in. This is a common uh, scenario where in a married couple, their needs diverge. Uh, and there's no one right answer, um, but it certainly is okay for the uh, intact uh, spouse to stay. And it's certainly okay for the intact spouse to live in a different part of the building. All right, because there's no point in one person's brain disease having two victims, right? If, if being on the memory care unit is a hardship for the healthier spouse, then she shouldn't have to stay uh, on, on the unit. Uh, but if she wants to, yeah, that's okay too. Okay, Paul, we'll do one more question. Um, I have no trouble standing up to my difficult mom, but my sister just can't do it. How do I help my sister? Or I have no troubles standing up to my difficult father-in-law but my husband just can't do it. How do I help my husband? I think it's a matter of, um, <laughs> frankly, it's a matter of the, uh, the spouse or the, the sibling who uh, cannot do this, getting some counseling and exploring what's holding them back, what, what historical events or what attitudes um, prevent them from being realistic and constructive in the present uh, with their loved one. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you all again. Um, that does conclude our talk today with Dr. Chavez. Thank you. I, I think everybody on this call today learned so much. And again, my notebook over here is just full of notes and extra and things that I just took, took in. So I do appreciate you. Um, thank you for your time today. And thank you. It's been all a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. So much on this call today. I do want to say before we log off this Zoom that Susan Berger, uh, Belmont Village, our community advisor, will um, be coming on right now to talk to you about Belmont Village in case you had any questions or met me looking for a place for your loved ones. So do um, stay on if you'd like to hear more about Belmont Village. And then one more thing, Paul, is there any way I think um, that you can share your link one more time in the chat box on how to order your book? There's lots of questions coming through on that. Uh, it's on Amazon. Just go to Amazon. It's on Amazon. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. The, the, you, the only book by me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So for everyone still on the Zoom, you can purchase Paul's book on Amazon. And I do highly recommend that. And I do hope that you'll stay for us to um, stay for us on the Zoom to learn more about Belmont Village. Thank you, Paul. I think what I've learned about this is that when we do speak about our parents, we have to understand how they embrace their age and changes in life and how they face the many challenges that come with aging. Many seniors enjoy their independence and control over their lives. So it's only natural to think of the senior living community as a loss of control, which is a chief fear of seniors. Such loss can include their independence, but also could include a loss of family and friends, not to mention a loss of their own home. But we have to realize that what our parents really need is not at all tangible. It's a deeper sense of purpose and belonging. And at Belmont Village, we strive to support our residents' sense of purpose and we enhance their quality of life. We know that every one of our residents has a story to tell and we seek to understand the things that are really important to them. And above all, we know they wanna maintain their identity. And in so doing, 
We want to learn about their past, their professional life, their personal challenges, as well as their hopes and dreams for the future. For 24 years, Belmont Village has owned and operated best in class, fully licensed senior living communities, founded on the belief that all seniors deserve to live self-directed lives in a supportive community. And that is one filled with friendships and interests, safety and security, quality and value in a place that they can call home. It's all about life. It's all about health. It's all about energy and purpose at Belmont Village. And we want all of our residents to stay healthy and active and in so doing to live well. So our goal every day for every resident is to support a healthy lifestyle. We know that what they eat and drink, how much they exercise and the way they socialize are all equally important. We believe in a person-centered approach in providing our services. And all of our residents receive help with activities of daily living as needed. Although their needs can vary, they can count on our caring and compassionate staff who are committed to providing high quality person-centered care. Residents can also count on our nurses. Those are trained medical professionals who are dedicated to serve the healthcare needs of each of our residents. Our nurses are keen observers and they can quickly assess those changes as they occur in residents' health. And most importantly, they're there 24 hours a day to provide peace of mind, not just for the resident, but for their family. And we know that successful aging also involves staying active. Whether they wanna kickstart their day with group fitness or one-on-one -on -one exercise, our goal is to help stimulate both their minds and body at whatever level they feel successful. And to specifically address the needs and abilities of residents with mild cognitive impairment and early stage memory loss, Belmont Village has pioneered a comprehensive therapeutic program that we call our Circle of Friends. This is a whole brain fitness lifestyle, and it's one that combines our highly regarded wellness model with mental fitness. And it has proven to have a profound impact on addressing the needs and abilities of residents with early stage memory loss. This innovative approach to memory care has changed how providers and their families now look at assisted living and memory care support. I'm very proud to say that in Belmont Village communities across our country in Mexico, we strive to create a positive experience for all of our members. They include our residents, their families, and our employees. And we continue year after year to set new standards in resident and family satisfaction. Understanding your parent and choosing the right senior living community for them is one of the most important life decisions. Please take the time to compare and do not wait for a crisis to react. If you have any questions about a Belmont village near you or the circle of friends, I do hope that you will give me a call or send me a text. My phone number is 424-232-0701. And my email is sberger at belmontvillage.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed Dr. Paul Schaffitz. I certainly did. And I look forward to seeing you at a next event. Christy, back to you. Yes, thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Dr. Schaffitz. We're so thankful for your talk today. And everybody I know just gained lots of information from this. And it was just a great, a great Zoom. So uh, thank you all who attended with us today. We were so glad that you joined us. And I hope that you all have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.